We're recording. We are. We're on the air. All right. Um, so we were talking last time about electrodynamics, and um, let me first ask if there are any questions. All right. Um, how, uh, let me also, let me ask a question then. How, um, how familiar are you with relativistic notation? That is to say, what has a, the, the problem with relativistic notation is that there are hidden minus signs, as well as a summation convention. And so the question I'm asking is, do, do you want me to um, try to be really clear about the hidden minus signs, or have you absorbed that in an E and M class or a special relativity class? I know when I was a graduate student, well, I skipped the E and M course and took the quantum field theory course as a first year graduate student. And as a result, I was pretty confused by all of this notation. Um, so, do you, do you guys want me? What? I'm on it. You're all right with it, okay, but there are others who may not be. Probably wouldn't hurt. Yeah, I think a lot of us have seen it before, but right. not like 100%. Right. So be a little more clear, okay. So, yeah, maybe I should, maybe I should, in fact, say something in general. Um, a contravariant vector is something that transforms as a, different, uh, a differential of the coordinates. In fact, we can say that um, suppose we have that x a prime is some x a prime of x. Then, in other words, we go from x a to x a prime, which is a function of x. This is actually what I'm doing is uh, telling you about these vectors in terms of, um, in fact, general uh, coordinate variance. Then dx prime a, what would it be? What would be the partial of x prime a with respect to, let us say, dx b, with respect to x b times dx b? So in other words, the differentials of coordinates transform this way. And this is what's called a contravariant vector. Um, the other kind of vector is a partial derivative. So in other words, a partial derivative with respect to some coordinates x a. I'm using upper a for the coordinates. How does this transform? Well, if we change variables, this is partial f partial x b times partial x b partial x a prime. Okay? So these are two different ways in which vectors transform. Two natural ways. These, this is a covariant vector derivatives. And if I write this, I would write this as d prime a of x. Okay. And th th this is um, this is true in for arbitrary transformations of coordinates. So this is the notation of general relativity is called special relativity. Okay, so there's something that's invariant, namely if you have a vector that's 
contravariant, so we write it as a sub a, and another vector that's covariant, and we sum over a, well, let me call this c. Then, if in a prime coordinate system, this would be a prime c, b prime c. Now, what is a prime c? Well, it transforms this way. So it's going to be, say, ad times partial x prime c partial x d. And this one is going to follow this rule, the covariant rule. So it's going to be b, I guess, e times the partial of um, x e partial x prime c. And now you see what you've got is, is sort of a double, a, a, a double uh, partial here. In other words, we've got partial x prime c, partial x d, partial x e, partial x prime c, times a d b e. But this is a chain rule form of the partial of x e with respect to x uh, d. That's a d. A d b e. And so that is a d b d, which is this. So in other words, quantities like this are invariant under, in fact, general coordinate transformation. So if you have a contravariant vector summed with a covariant vector, the product summed over the coordinate labels going typically from 0 to 3, this thing is invariant then under the general coordinate transformation. And we're talking in general about special relativity, so it would be certainly invariant under special relativity. So, so in uh, quantum field theory, we always try to have things that are invariant under uh, at least special uh, coordinate transformation. So, are there any questions? I've got enough chocolate for this lecture. And in fact, yesterday evening I bought a new bag of chocolate. Um, so I think I'm good for this whole semester. Any, so any further questions? Okay, now let me then go on with this, but in a way that's maybe a little bit clearer. So we have A sub B is um, minus the scale of potential over C and then A. And A upper B would then be B over C, A. The, the, um, let's see, what I forgot to describe is why it is that the switch from covariant to contravariant is um, a minus sign on the time variable or the space variable. Um, well, the basic, I, I guess the basic principle is that that's what's invariant. In other words, this was true. Here, this is just mathematics. The physics comes in when we say that, in fact, 
um, rents in a products with a, a particular metric, in other words, the eta metric, uh, are invariant. That is to say that AB is eta BC AC, where eta is um, minus one, 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 one. And um, you can call that either eta BC or eta lower BC. So the physics is that it's, this is the metric of, um, of physical space time, flat space time. Okay, so last time we had um, talked about in this notation and um, I'm starting out in MKSA units and then I'm going to translate to um, to natural units. Um, so these are um, this says there are no magnetic monopoles. This is uh, Faraday's law. And um, let me skip to the microscopic. It's, it's, short. it's just terrible. Anyway, del dot E is rho over epsilon zero. This is called the electric constant. And then we have curl of B is uh, mu zero of J um, plus E dot over C squared. Mu, uh, mu zero is the magnetic constant, and the cause mu zero epsilon zero is the of c squared. Okay. Um, if you have the right hand side of these two, you set the right hand side of these two to zero. So we're talking about the electromagnetic field of vacuum. Then, of course. You can take the curl of um, this equation and you get curl of curl B is minus 1 over C squared um, E double dot. Um, and you can rewrite this as divergence or gradient of divergence of e, e minus Laplacian, and so that's equal to that, and so you have the equation E double dot over C squared minus grad E minus Laplacian E is zero, and then similarly if you take the curl of the curl of B, you get um, minus one over C squared E double dot, and this is um, the gradient of the divergence of B uh, minus Laplacian of B, and so this gives you um, B double dot over C squared minus Laplacian B. So these are the true wave equations. This thing is zero because we're in vacuum, so rho is zero. This is zero because it's always zero as far as we know. And so this is just something you've seen, I'm sure, in electrodynamics as undergraduate. Undergrad. Um, these homogeneous equations, this one and that one, these are effectively four equations. This is one equation. This is the vector equation, so it's three equations. We can rewrite them as, let me remind you what f i f what F is. So F A B say is 
partial a b partial x a minus partial a a partial x b, where a and b go from zero to three. And so you can rewrite those homogeneous, those two homogeneous, four effectively homogeneous equations as, um, let me switch to IJK because that's what's in my notes. And if I try it on the fly with ABC, I'm going to get it wrong. Now, why is this zero? Well, this is di, and this is dj ak minus dk aj plus dk di aj minus dk ai, and then um, plus dj dk a i minus p i a k. So if you keep these straight, you see that you get zero. di dj a k, well where would where do we find that? Well, dj, di, ak, but a minus sign. And so this one cancels this one. di, dk with a minus sign, dk, di with a plus sign. So this one cancels that one. And then these two also cancel. So this is zero automatically. This is called the Bianchi identity. And um, one can write it as a general covariant equation. You introduce something that's um, epsilon i j l i j k d i f j k equals zero. Um, this is totally anti-symmetric. Um, and uh, what we just wrote down here, we can rewrite in this way. And um, that L I J K. Excuse me. Does that say L or I J K? <coughs> Epsilon L I J K D I F J F D I F J K. So these are four equations because there are four L's. And okay. So those are the two homogeneous equations. We can rewrite the inhomogeneous equations as di fki is magnetic constant times jk. So these then are the Maxwell equations. And there are all sorts of other ways of writing them, but I don't know what you need to try to do all the possible ways. Um, was four equations. Four equations, right. For four values of L, L equals zero, one, two, three. Yeah. But so how is that related to? To one. Well, that's related to the, these are the four equations. This one and these three. I, I, it, it, it can't be obvious, but it's true. Um, 
So what you do, in other words, is pick a particular value for L, and then substitute in there. For example, I guess I might as well do it if it's puzzling. Um, let L, e, L be 0. Then we would have D1 F23 plus D2 F, um, let's see, I want to, if, if I want to keep this positive, I think I'll just cyclically permute these. So F31 plus D3 F12 um, equals zero. Well, this is the divergence of B. See, this is B1, this is B2, that's B3. And this, um, this was the uh, an earlier equation where bi is uh, a half epsilon ijk fjk. So that's that one. If instead we pick L equal to say 1, you want me to do the 1 case? Let's have some voting here. All right. So I recommend that you guys then at home set L equal to 1, say, and work this out. And you should get then one of these three equations. All right. Now, any, any more questions? This J, by the way, that I introduced here, uh, is still an N MKS unit. JK is C times the charge density times J vector. And since we're still talking about special relativity, <coughs> let me. force law, it's M D2X, say, A, D tau squared is M UI D tau, all being proper time, which is D PI D tau, PI is M I is going from 0 to 3 here. This is Fi, and this is Q, Fij, Dxj, D tor. This is also Q, Fij, Uj. And if you cancel a factor of dt, d tor, you get say a dot. Oh, I screwed this up. Let's make this an I. I wanted to switch to ABC, which I think is a better notation, but I just followed what was in the notes. Q times E dot V, E the electric 
field. And this is the um, energy. So this is a terrible notation. Um, so what's, what's interesting about this is that Maxwell's equations obeyed special relativity and moreover the only change that you really need is to recognize that this P here is MU which is to say MV over the square root of 1 minus V squared. So the only change is this denominator in P. Apart from that, um, Maxwell's equations were perfect. And the reason why they were so accurate, of course, is that um, electro electrical forces are just, are just the right length and strength for experiments in the 19th century to be accurate. Um, uh, the length, of course, in an electromagnetic interaction is, is infinite because they fall off as 1 over r in potential 1 over r squared as a force, not exponentially. And um, so with gravity, on the other hand, uh, gravity is um, just incredibly weaker. And um, fortunately, it's long range. And then the other two kinds of forces, the weak force and the strong force, both very short range. So they didn't become um, well described until um, let's say, uh, late 60s, mid 70s. Okay. Um, so I'm now going to switch to natural units, and um, <coughs> yeah, are there any What's the action for electrodynamics? Well, it's again natural units minus a quarter F uh, A B F A B plus J B A B plus whatever the matter action is. Not matter what wrong action density is. F A B is the same F A B is over there. And Consequently, this thing is an integral minus quarter dA AB minus dB AA dA AB minus dB AA um, plus JB AB plus whatever that is. And this is the same thing as one half e squared minus b squared. So I'm going to three dimensional notation now. J dot a minus j zero a zero and then plus this. So uh, so this just transfers directly to that. And um, uh, I guess I, let me just remind you that, I'm, uh, that EI, or let me use an upper I, this is I equals one, two, three. 
Pi is C partial A0 partial Xi minus partial X0 A lower I. This is maybe not the best notation, but if we switch then to um, so this is C F and we use oh there's a question. Let me, let me just get these bloody indices straight. I zero. Yes. Um, just a quick question about what your last term is up there. Okay, I um, actually have to give you two. One for the man in the camera and one thank for the you. question. Um, what is the first symbol in the last term on the equation on the top of that board right there? Here? Yes, what is that? That's an L. That's an L, okay, thank you. Capital L. Capital L, okay. What is the L? Mm -hmm. What's the L? What is the L stand, stand for? It's the Lagrange density or the action density of the matter fields. I should have mentioned that. Yes. Uh, F. Um, we can oh, sorry. Uh, F. I sorry. Covariant or contravariant variables. Give me that again. So now? you F. You use the up both for contravariant variables and uh, covariant variables. So An upper index is covariant. Yeah. Lower index. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Upper index is contravariant. Lower index is covariant. Uh -huh. But and that's true for for these guys and these guys also. And so and yeah. In what case you can use your contravariant variables? And in what case in what case you can use your covariant variables? Well, you can use them all. They're in, in special relativity. Uh, a sub a is just a to a b. A B. Yeah. And so that means that A upper is is um, in, again in natural units it's the scale of potential or it's A zero A vector and A lower A is minus a zero a and a upper zero things with upper indices you can think of as always positive not positive in some absence and things with upper indices do not have hidden minus signs um, actually it's it's just that notation? It's, let's put it this way, coordinates and fields with upper indices have no hidden minus signs. Derivatives with lower indices have no hidden minus signs. So in other words, d sub a is partial with respect to x upper a. And so this is d by dt grad d lower a. On the other hand, d upper a is minus d by dt rad. All right. Um, I had I put some time ago on the web page my notes on tensors. Um, there's a discussion there of the whole business. Um, in special relativity and general relativity. Um, so, and I hope the material is clear. If you find a typo or something that really needs to be explained that's not well explained, um, do send me an email. Um, I'm now correcting the proofs to the book and um, um, proofs by the way of that text. Um, so I can still make changes. 
All right, so we, any other questions? Okay, so here's our um, action. And um, now I want to say something about gauge invariance in, in electrodynamics. Um, the idea is that a charged matter field transforms this way. E to the i theta of x Theta is probably a lousy choice because theta is also the heavy side function. I don't mean the heavy side function here, I just mean some any arbitrary function. So let me maybe change that to lambda if I can. Lambda of x. And at the same time we change A to B say. So the, the AB plus I times the B derivative of P e to the I lambda of X. And this multiplied by E to the minus I lambda of X. And this then is just AB of X minus DB lambda of X. So A changes by the four derivative of some function. And the matter field, the charge matter field, changes by E to the I lambda times that. Now what's, what's interesting about this is that the transformation depends upon the space time in uh, point X. And that means it's a local gauge transformation. And of course this was known in the 19th century. The part that was known in the 19th century is the bottom line. This part didn't become clear until the 20th century and I suppose, I don't know, 1915, 19, 20, 19, what, what do you mean by didn't become clear or was known in the, what was known? What was known in the 19th century? The bottom line was known in the 19th century. What, what, what was about the bottom line? Just about the possible. What was, oh, okay. Gauge great, happened. great, great question. Um, what was known in the 19th century was that if you made this transformation, replace the gauge fields by the gradient of an arbitrary function of space-time, then Maxwell's equations were invariant. Unfortunately, yeah, I have not erased them. Maxwell's equations are here. F is invariant under a gauge transformation. And the reason, of course, is that um, It's the anti-symmetry of this thing. So in other words, F prime is the derivative of AB, what did I say, minus DB of lambda, partial XA, minus the partial of AA minus DA of lambda partial xd. And now, of course, um, what you get is the first term, in other words, db, partial ab, partial xa, minus partial a, a, partial xb. But these terms cancel because it's minus dA dB lambda plus dB dA lambda. And of course, these two things cancel because deriv partial derivatives respect to space, space time variables commute with each other. So this cancels that. And so that's equal to F uh, AB. So F prime AB is equal to F AB. 
And so what was known in the 19th century was that if you made that gauge transformation, even with lambda being an arbitrary function of space-time, F, the field strength tensor or the Faraday tensor was invariant, and consequently Maxwell's <coughs> equations were invariant. So they knew that Maxwell's equations were invariant in the gauge transformations, and that's all that electrodynamics was in the 19th century. Then in the 20th century, sometime in the 20s, people realized that this current, quantum mechanically, was something like this, and I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, essentially uh, the Dirac form for the current is the four vector field, the four vector field with the gamma zero, the gamma matrices, a charge, and this, under a gauge transformation, uh, doesn't change. And in fact, the thing that, under the gauge transformation, this turns into psi bar e to the minus, what did I say, minus i lambda gamma mu e to the i lambda psi. So this thing is invariant. The J is invariant. What's also true is that the, is that the uh, equations of motion of the theory and the action are invariant. And that's not really obvious from this, but since you brought it up, maybe I should say something about this. Um, that one's the over there with gamma. Excuse me? That the quantity over there that's invariant. That's invariant, yes. What is it? The current. That's called the current, yes. This would be J lower mu. This is the... So it's J mu prime, but it's equal to J mu because the thing is obviously invariant. What's not obvious is, unfortunately, I didn't bring my notes for this, but what's not obvious all right let me do you want to see the non abelian side of things? All right I can do I can I will try to do it extemporaneously or winging it as they say um, but I may screw up a minus sign or two. Two would be better. <laughs> So now what we have so this thing is an n vector. So it's in other words, what this really is is psi i prime of x is ui j of x psi j of x. Sum to course over j. And the idea here is that u of x is a u, an n by n unitary matrix. U dagger u. You don't like this. Not a billion, man. It's easy. <laughs> no, no, no. I, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even bribe you with the chocolate. <clears throat> I thought you guys would like me to do something with this car. What? I think you left. Excuse me? I think you left for that reason. Okay. Alright, you die you is one, so it's a unitary matrix. Alright. Now Right, but in fact, these unitary matrices form nice groups, like SU2, that's the group of unitary 2 by 2 matrices of determinant 1, 
SU3 is a group of three by three unitary matrices of the term of one and so forth. So it's some, it's typically that sort of matrix. Now, it's easy to get something like this to be invariant because this prime is just psi dagger u dagger u psi, and this is just psi dagger psi, you don't even need to worry about the space-time dependence. On the other hand, what you know is that the matter fields have derivatives when they appear in the action sometimes. In fact, it's possible that they appear with derivatives all the time. So the question is, how do you have something like this, in fact, what do you do? You've got something like that in the action. And so you want to make that gauge invariant. And so what Yang and Mills did was they said, well, and this, this is a generalization of what, um, of, of the ordinary gauge transformation. They said, well, we're going to say that this is, and there's actually an I hidden in here. <coughs> so I'll bring out the, the I in a, in, a, in a minute. So what we want, this will be fine if we have DA plus AA psi prime equal to u dA plus aA psi. Because then psi dagger dA plus aA psi prime would be psi dagger u dagger u d a plus a a psi. Okay? And that would just be psi dagger d a plus a a psi. And the same would be true if we had here, instead of psi dagger, if we had d a plus a a psi dagger. So the question is, how do we get this to work? Well, it's kind of obvious. Once you ask, once you write the question correctly, it's easy to find out what the answer is. Oh my god, I erased all this, which I was going to use. So I'm going to have to write it twice. So what we want is we want this. So what does that say? That says dA of psi prime plus A prime A psi prime should be the right-hand side, which is U dA plus AA psi. And we know what psi prime is. This is dA U of X psi plus A prime A U of X psi equals u of x dA psi of x plus aA, I might as well say aA of x. Actually, this is, let me, let me stop putting in all these x's because it's just making things complicated. <coughs> This is dA of psi prime, so that's this. That, so I'm going to leave out the x. Everything depends upon x. Okay, so this is the equation we have to satisfy. And that gives us our answer because it's an equation for a sub a prime. And that says then, the 
taking a sub a prime u psi has to be the last term is u a sub a psi and then there's plus u da psi and then there's minus da u psi okay all right So, um, we can write this as u a a u inverse or u adjoint times u psi. And now let's cancel a little bit of this. This dA can act on u or can act on psi. So this thing is u U D A psi minus D A psi U minus U. I wrote this back. This was stupid. Let me write. This is minus. Well, no, I did it right the first time. All right, D A U psi minus u da psi. <clears throat> okay, so this term and this term cancel, and so what we have here is just minus da u <clears throat> psi but I'm going to write that as u inverse u psi. Oh, and I should have written it this way. u a sub a u inverse u psi. So our equation is a prime u psi is u a sub a u inverse u psi minus d a u u inverse u psi. So everything will work as long as we have that a sub a prime is equal to u a u inverse um, minus d a u times u inverse, where u is an n by n unitary matrix. So this is the secret of Yang-Mills theory non immediately engaged theory. And the, the equation then is also psi prime is u psi. And everything depends upon the space time. And this is a generalization then, you see, of the electromagnetic equation. There's an A here. When, when the U, in the case of electrodynamics, is just e to the i lambda. So U, U inverse is just 1. And then we have minus dA of, say, e to the i lambda, e to the minus i lambda. And so this is A sub A minus i e lambda piece of A of lambda. And the difference is that, uh, that this, this in, order to, in order not to have a lot of I's floating around, I wrote it this way. But this A is I times the, this is an anti-permission matrix of gauge fields. And so the equation, when we come back to ordinary notation, I, I, I. And then, of course, psi prime is E, E, I, lambda, psi. And lambda and psi depend upon X. So this is the, what's called, abelian gauge transformation, because it's just a U1 gauge group. U1 meaning one by one unitary matrices, which are just 
complex numbers of modulus 1, and that then is the simple case, this is the general case, the general ordinary number. So there, there must be a couple of questions, so I must have left out something. So I missed that last part, um, just from the bottom back up to the top. In other words, how it is that this turns into this? Yeah. Well, we just let u equal e to the i lambda, and then I confess that over here, instead of having a real uh, a Hermitian matrix of gauge fields, I had a an anti-Hermitian one. I had a, a secret i in there, and so. And you see that that must be true because um, the derivative of the unitary matrix is going to bring down something that's anti-hermitian. Uh, because the unitary matrix is an exponential of an anti-hermitian matrix. Is that OK? All right, well, um, so we've gone uh, quite a bit. Are there any other questions? Damn it, I forgot what page I'm supposed to go to here. This is like page 401. Story time, right? Okay. So, in fact, it's past story time. Let me just tell you um, how it was that Oppenheimer got into deep trouble with some rather awful people in Washington. In um, oh God, when was this? Um, forty-nine, June forty-nine. There was something called the House Un-American Activities Committee. This was a horrible. You and the United States went nuts about the Soviet Union and communism. And in particular, there was one politician who was really awful, Joseph McCarthy. And he was making himself famous by claiming that there were communists everywhere who were, who were threatening America. And um, one of the things that they, that his committee wanted to investigate was whether certain products should not be shipped overseas because they were um, of military significance and shouldn't be sent, shouldn't be sold to Russians. And um, so the question then was, um, what about isotopes? And uh, so maybe I should just read from this. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Oppenheimer by a guy named Kai Bird and Martin Schur. Um, When Oppenheimer entered the caucus room of the Senate office building, he was aware of Strauss's concern. Strauss thought that, that uh, isotopes shouldn't be sent abroad, but he did not share them. And he now made clear that he thought these concerns foolish. Quote, no one can force me to say, unquote, he testified, quote, that you cannot use these isotopes for atomic energy. You can use a shovel for atomic energy. In fact, you do. You can use a bottle of beer for atomic energy. In fact, you do. So there was some laughter. Anyway, Joe Volpe, it turned out, was one of the, well, let me go on. Oppenheimer's next, more laughter greeted Oppenheimer's next statement. My own rating of the importance of isotopes in this broad sense is that they are far less important than electronic devices. But far more important than, let us say, vitamins, somewhere in between. And on the way out, um, Oppenheimer asked his friend Joe Volpe, well, Joe, how did I do? And the lawyer replied uneasily, too well, Robert, much too well. So um, Oppenheimer there had made fun of this guy Strauss, who's a very important politician. And 
he then made it his goal to persecute Oppenheimer. And, um, anyway, I'm not going to go into that whole story. That was enough for the story. Um, by the way, let me just mention something about the fire that I mentioned to the CEA. What dropped for it? It wasn't 64, it was the summer of 65. Secondly, um, the cause was that they had a beryllium window, a very thin window made of beryllium, so that the, um, some of the beams could go through. And that window, for some reason, shattered and let the hydrogen, liquid hydrogen out. And when the hydrogen hit the floor, it ignited. And uh, there were six people burned, one fatally. And what made things worse is, of course, because of safety regulations and legal issues, the scientists at the Cambridge Electron Accelerator had to put up warning signs of radiation hazard everywhere. And so when the firemen came, they were afraid to enter the building. And even though it was a fire inside, so they just broke windows and shot huge quantities of water in there. It turned out that um, some of the people who were burned and injured couldn't stand up. And they were in danger of drowning in the water that was pumped in by the firemen who refused to enter the building. One of the physicists came by with a key and said, hey, let me unlock this. The firemen wouldn't let him near the building. He said, but I have a key. It's not a it's only, it's only radiation when the machine's on, the machine's not on. We wouldn't let him in. And then one of, another physicist came by and said, I'm a, phys I'm a professor at MIT. I understand radiation. There's no problem with the environment let him in. And at that point, um, they brought the injured people out. It was nothing more painful, or almost nothing more, as painful as a burn injury because of, um, well, never mind why, but any burn injuries are terrible. And so there were these five people who had terrible burn injuries. One guy was keeping some, one person alive, couldn't keep his head above water. Uh, the water pumped in by the fire. <laughs> and um, one person was either dying or already dead. Um, but, uh, it, it was, I, I don't know how much time, don't remember how much time went by, but it was a significant amount of time went by while uh, instead of bringing the wounded out, taking them to the uh, hospital, they just kept pouring water and didn't let anybody into the building. And um, that's, we can make fun of that, but in fact, most people still have an exaggerated fear of radiation. And uh, that's in fact the reason why the coal industry is so powerful in the United States. It would have been wiped out by nuclear power in the 40s, or the, not the 40s, but the 50s and 60s. Instead, everybody's so frightened of radiation that we've got um, most of our electricity made by coal fired power plants, which produce so much air pollution that they kill more than 10,000 Americans every year because of particulate matter. Uh, the, uh, and for that matter, they put out a lot of radiation because they're isotopes of carbon and uh, radioactive. And the other stuff that goes on in mercury. Um, okay, on with the physics. Um, so, so much, I, I explain in, in a little more detail the um, gauge transformation in these notes, which are online. I, believe, I haven't put them online yet. I'll put them online tonight, um, right after class. Let me just mention what, um, what one does with one of these gauge transformations. One transforms the gauge called the Um, let me see, let me follow the right sequence here. Okay. What we, what one can do is one can make a gauge transformation with all kinds of different gauges. And the, the most physical gauge, the one that understand best 
is the um, is the Coulomb gauge. That's a gauge where you you transform to a gauge in which the divergence of A vanishes, as you know. And how do you do that? Well, you make a gauge transformation so that A prime minus the gradient of say lambda is zero. Well, I'm sorry. The gradient the gradient of A prime equal to the gradient A minus gradient I'm sorry, the divergence of A prime, which is the divergence of A minus the gradient of lambda should vanish. So what you do is you say that the Laplacian of lambda should be the divergence of A. You make that gauge transformation, then the transform gauge field has zero divergence. This is called the Coulomb gauge. It's also called the radiation gauge. And it may even have a third name, which I can't remember. We now go back to Gauss's law. Delta E is rho over epsilon zero. And in fact, if, um, if, we're, if we're in, I'm trying to keep the C straight also. Um, no, it's just like that. Rho over epsilon zero. So this is saying the divergence of uh, C gradient A zero minus A dot. That's what E is. And that has to be rho A zero. This divergence hits this term and we get zero. And so what we have then is that the Laplacian of A zero, which is minus Laplacian of A up to zero, is rho. Actually, there's a C here. Is rho over epsilon zero. So we have minus Laplacian of A zero is rho over C epsilon zero. So as I said before, Gauss's law is a constraint. And this tells us that A0 is determined by the charge density. That means it's not an independent physical variable. It's a dependent variable. Yes. Is that a signature to the this one? Yeah. Uh, you've got a contrabatter and that changes the variable. Yeah, well, when you flip A, when you flip the zero component, you get a minus sign. Oh, just for the value of zero. Right. Okay. Good question. So we solve for A0. And in fact, let me call this J0. So then we have A0 of x and t is an integral of J0 of y and t d cube y over 4 pi x minus y. That's the solution of that equation. Now, I'm just taking for granted that you know how to, how, to, how to invert this thing and get that, or do you want me to do it explicitly? In fact, I think you've seen it in, probably you've seen it in, as undergraduates in electric dynamics, yes. All right. So I don't think I need to do this for you. Okay, so I wrote down what the action is, what the Lagrange density is. And so now, what is, uh, I'm now going to, I'm going to start the canonical quantization, but I don't, we're not going to get very far. So what do we do? The canonically conjugate variable pi b is going to be the partial of the Lagrange, or the action density with respect to um, a sub b dot and I'm a bit casual here. Um, this is a space index, so it's in fact the same thing as um, we don't need to worry about whether this is up or down because it doesn't matter because it's a space index. And um, so this is minus a quarter. Um, Oh, that's a typo. 
Oh my goodness, look at all those typos. All right, well, in other words, this is equivalently partial, that all partial, and you can think of this as D0 AB. And so this is minus a quarter partial with respect to A0B of, so now what you've got here is um, you have A0B minus, for example, AB0, and this one is times A. Sorry, D0 AB, and I shouldn't have written A0 B, it's D0. Part, it's partial with respect to D0 AB, and this is D0 AB minus DB A0, and then here it's D0 AB minus DB A0. That's the part of the action that's relevant. And you see, you can differentiate with respect to this one or that one. And um, in fact, there's another term which just has a B here and a zero there. And consequently, you get altogether four terms. And so the answer is that this pi B is simply minus D zero a B, which is the same thing as A B dot. So the upshot is pi B is A B dot. And so the quantization then in the Coulomb gauge is, first of all, you don't try to quantize A0, you remove it. You say it's an integral that A0 is this thing. A0 of X and T is this. And you now have three variables to quantize, but not really three, you really only have two because the divergence of A is zero. And so um, the question is, how do you quantize these when they're both transverse? Well, that was a problem that was worked out by Dirac, it turns out. It's just amazing how um, many problems he solved. And it's rather, there's something called Dirac brackets. We could do it, if you really want, I could do it in class in detail. What I propose is we just uh, skip the Dirac brackets and just go to the answer. Um, but uh, I can tell you where the, uh, where the, if you want to find the detailed discussion of it, it's chapters 7 and 8. Weinberg's book, Quantum Theory of Fields, Volume 1. And um, there may be other places where it's done, but um, you can be sure if it's Weinberg. Um, all right, so why don't we stop where we're all the time?